All right. Well, we're going to go get started. Thank you so much for uh, everybody coming. Today is the, the first annual uh, Community Engagement Symposium, hopefully annual. Um, again, um, this is the School of Architecture and Planning. Um, thank you so much for um, the staff that's really been uh, instrumental in making this happen. Uh, uh, we really want to make you feel welcome. One of the things that, in terms of just housekeeping, there's restrooms at the end of the hall, uh, far, far end of the hall. So if you need to use that, by all means, at any time, please uh, you know, use the restroom if you need to. I just want to talk a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Tim Castillo. I'm actually a professor here in the School of Architecture and Planning. Uh, this is my 21st year here. Uh, and I grew up in Silver City. So we have a uh, lieutenant governor from Silver City and one of my other colleagues, Priscilla, here from Silver City. And um, when I came back to the state, I did my undergrad here at UNM. And, uh, and then I left back east and was practicing architecture back uh, back east in New York City and uh, never thought I would come back. I was one of those kids. It's like I couldn't wait to leave the little town to kind of experience the world. Uh, and then I guess I got real homesick and I ended up coming back here. And so um, and it's been an amazing experience. One of the things um, when I took this position at UNM was I really wanted to, to think about how to give back to the program. Uh, but also to the state and really think about what that means. And so in 2016, this photograph is a group of uh, students from uh, the School of Architecture here at UNM and from Woodbury University uh, in California. And my colleague and I, we set up this program calling, called Finding Rural. And it was really looking at how to um, look at problem solving in, in Silver City and Grant County, but also looking at how we could potentially look at economic development through the lens of design. So. Um, you know, we've continued to uh, work in different communities across the state, and it's something that I, I'm very passionate about and, and very happy that, that we established this program. So it's an ongoing thing and just a little bit of background on uh, what I do. Um, when I stepped into this role, uh, I was very enthusiastic. Provost uh, Holloway asked me to, to step into this role. And one of the things that, um, that I really was encouraged about was the amount of faculty and staff that work across the state of New Mexico. One of our um, missions is really to advance New Mexico. And that is one of the things that I think community engagement is gonna play a big role in. And so, so many of my colleagues uh, have do amazing work and really looking at how to benefit those communities. And so, uh, of course, this is a map of New Mexico. And I think we, we work in almost every county uh, at some point. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is really understand the impact that we're having and really trying to develop uh, uh, an organization, an office that really starts to help uh, build energy around community engagement and visibility. One of the things that we have uh, is what we call the Carnegie classification. It's a, um, it's really dedicated to community engagement. And many years ago, uh, in 2020, we were awarded this. Uh, it's really a, um, a way of really promoting community engagement uh, in institutions in higher ed. Um, my my predecessor Monica Kowal really worked very very hard to to get this classification. You have to submit a, a dense package uh, to the Carnegie Foundation, and uh, and we got awarded. And so we're one of um, 357 institutions across the U.S. that have this classification. So we're very proud of it. Um, I think one of the things that we're trying to do now is really use this classification to really uh, promote some of our work both regionally and globally. Um, I do have to acknowledge my uh, advisory staff uh, or my advisory committee. Uh, they've been tremendous. Um, some of them are here in the in the room. Um, they have been really instrumental in rethinking the way that we look at community engagement. Um, Manuel is here. Rebecca's here in the back. Uh, some of the other ones will show up a little bit later. They're teaching today, so uh, they'll be in and out. But uh, We've really taken a, a look at uh, a community engagement across the campus, and they are really thinking broad spectrum about how this is going to impact UNM uh, for the future and, and really the state of New Mexico as well. Uh, in terms of uh, the format today, uh, we're going to have a couple of panels. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, here, and, and then I'm going to turn it over to Provost Holloway. Um, but we've got some great uh, panelists here. We brought uh, community members from across uh, the state of New Mexico to talk about how uh, we've worked in those communities and potentially 
um, what's going on right now and how we in the future can start to build these networks and uh, really impact the state holistically. Um, the second panel is really dedicated to um, uh, centers and institutes here at UNM that are doing tremendous work in, um, in the state, really understanding what it takes to, uh, to run a center, uh, the financing that it takes to, to keep and sustain these uh, entities and, and really get a perspective about where we're headed with the, the work that they're doing. So um, that'll be in the second half of the symposium. And then we're honored to have uh, our Lieutenant Governor uh, Morales here today. Uh, such an honor to have him here um, at UNM and um, just a great partner. Um, back when uh, Lieutenant Governor Morales was uh, the state senator, we started our work in Silver City. So he's been a, a great advocate uh, for our work and just really appreciate uh, you coming here today. So, um, and he'll be uh, closing us out with his keynote uh, at around 4.30. And uh, President Stokes will be coming uh, to introduce uh, the Lieutenant Governor. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Provost Holloway. Um, he's been uh, a great advocate for us in terms of community engagement and uh, just wanted to let him uh, speak a little bit about his vision for the future. Thanks, Tim. And really thank all of you. Thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, this is very much a beginning uh, of trying to uh, organize ourselves in a more holistic way across the University of New Mexico in the work that we do around community-engaged scholarship, community-engaged education. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of themes I can pull out here, and I'll start, as we always do these days, with UNM 2040 and our strategic plan, which has five major goals. Um, and the first goal is Advance New Mexico. And the work that, that, that you folks in this room do does that in a very direct way. Community-engaged scholarship, community-engaged education is one of the ways that the University of New Mexico really can use the talents, the energy, the, the, uh, the brilliance of minds that we have here at UNM to support uh, the state that supports us. And, and that's a, an incredibly important thing for us to do. The second piece of the second major goal is around student experience um, and the kinds of, of experiences that you all create for our students, undergraduate students, graduate students, um, through community engaged work, through engagement with community, the learning that comes for our students to learn, the humility to work with uh, folks outside the academy, the humility to understand the, the knowledge and expertise that communities has have is deep and rich and as deep and rich as the more formal scholastic knowledge that we may, we may privilege. Um, that's an incredibly important set of experiences for our students. Our third goal in 2040 is around inclusive excellence. And of course, one of the things that, that all of you do and your colleagues who do this kind of work is engage with diverse communities. Um, and so again, a very direct connection. Uh, our fourth, fourth goal is around sustainability which is sustainability in all of its uh, dimensions, with financial sustainability, ecological sustainability, but also the social aspect of sustainability. And again, the work that we do as a community engaged university um, is I think an incredibly important way that we demonstrate to the state, to the communities of the state, to the people of the state, that the work we do is not for ourselves, but is for the state that we love and that supports us. Uh, and I think that's an incredibly powerful tool for us to demonstrate to the state that we're deserving of the support that they generously give us. And our last goal in 2040, one university, about working together across the university, we'll hear some of that today. Um, as, as Tim started to dig into this work, um, you know, I think what he discovered is he's, he's been doing community engaged work his whole career. Um, to discover literally the hundreds of colleagues across the University of New Mexico who do that kind of work and that it really happens in every corner of this institution is I think uh, really exciting. And one of our goals starting with a forum like this and continuing through a set of, of further activities that Tim is helping us organize with his steering committee is really to help bring all of that together across the institution, to create visibility within the institution for who's doing what where because really we are incredibly engaged, but it's not always visible even to us. 
Um, it's hard for us to know where each of our faculty, staff, students may in fact be doing this kind of engaged work. Um, and, and because of that, not only do we have some lack of knowledge internally, we're probably missing opportunities. We're missing opportunities to work together, to learn from each other. Um, and we could probably be more effective and have richer impacts if we can be more together. Uh, and so that's an important goal for the work that, that we've asked him to take on. Now, Tim mentioned the Carnegie classification as a community engaged university. Um, that has an interesting origin. Uh, and so I'll start it this way. The University of New Mexico is not the land grant. That's NMSU, but we act like a land grant. Community engaged work is the work that land grants were designed to do. And yet University of New Mexico does a tremendous amount of community engaged work. Tim misspoke, he said, we're in almost every county. We're in every county, we know that. We know that there is work going on supported by the University of New Mexico in literally every county this day. We're incredibly engaged. And, and there's this whole notion of the modern land grant as being engaged in ways far beyond the traditional, it's about agriculture, but in all of these other ways that we may be in planning and healthcare, in community uh, development and capacity building. And we do all of those things. The Carnegie classification for community engaged universities was actually created to recognize the universities that were doing land grant like work, but were not the land grants. It was explicitly created with that purpose. Um, and so that really is part of who the University of New Mexico is. Uh, I'm excited and proud to be part of a university that engages with the community, with the state that supports us in this way. And I'm really excited to see the work that Tim and, and all of you as colleagues do to help bring us together to be more effective uh, and uh, uh, grow both internally and uh, grow the capacity of the state that we love. So thank you. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Tim. Thank you, uh, Provost Holloway. Um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna switch it up a bit. Um, I just got a message that uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Morales has to to leave us a little early. So I thought uh, we should probably have him uh, speak earlier than later. And so uh, and with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, Lieutenant Governor and uh, uh, please welcome him to the stage. Well, good afternoon. It's so good to be here. And I apologize about the change in, in schedule. Um, when the governor's out of state, and in this case, she was out of the country, um, I have to do dual roles. So she was expected to be at New Mexico State. We had a wonderful ribbon cutting on, on a new processing center that they did, um, but I was having to fill in there. Fortunately, I was able to uh, be scheduled early enough. So thank you, Tim, for, for putting that on our schedule because I wasn't going to miss that. So I did have to catch the flight from Las Cruces this morning to uh, here in Albuquerque, but in order to get the pilots back at the time that's needed, I'll have to depart by 2.30, but I didn't want to miss this. <laughs> so so thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be here. And when I look around and seeing all those that are involved and collaborating on this wonderful uh, re-ignition uh, of a community engagement approach, it's inspiring to me because I think that when we look back and see every single one of our stories, what that means and what that impact is when we talk about engagement. Uh, and it's good to be here with some people that I haven't seen in so, so long. Rebecca, so good to see you. Many years have been able to go through our education system together. Thank you for all that you've done. It's good to be here. And as I was there, Robert Holloway was sharing just a little bit about um, when he was talking about uh, what this means, the background of what that's gone into. He said, you know, Tim, maybe you can share a little bit of stories about Tim growing up with Tim. I, I would share some stories, but the reality of it is he's older than I am, so, so I don't have those stories. But we grew up in our hometown there in Silver City, and our families were very close. My my father, my uncles, uh, our relatives were very close to Tim's father, Tim's uncles, and we have something very much uh, in, in uh, comparison and very much uh, aligned is that our families are very big large families in the small part of, of, of Southwest New Mexico. And it really gave us that sense of what that means when it comes to community. 
and what that means for every single one of us. In a little bit, you're going to hear from pa our panelists. Lisa, thank you so much for being here and your amazing representation of New Mexico higher education and all that you're doing to go all around the state to make sure that we are collaborating with all of our institutions. Thank you for that. And then we have Priscilla Lucero who's here. Me and Priscilla probably spend most of the week together, whether it's on the phone, whether it's in person, or like on Tuesday for Halloween, we're there blocking doing road uh, road um, traffic control because we had a group that Priscilla is, is part of, of Valley, uh, Valley Encanto, it's a ballet protocol group that Priscilla is one of the maestras. So we were there blocking off traffic so they can do a block party to do the dances. But really my, my story with Priscilla is just like with Tim, we go so far back and the connection of what that means when we talk about family, when we talk about the importance of the state of New Mexico and bringing it together. Priscilla was there when my father passed away in 2019. She was there providing support. I was there when her father passed away. We're there to continue to provide support as we go through the journey of what that means of being together in this state. And so when we talk about the impact of engagement, as an educator, as a student here at UNM, I can remember just going to some of the classes and having wonderful experiences, playing baseball there on the fall league with Rich all day and making that network connection with people that we still work with throughout this day. And when we see what, as an educator, that means, oftentimes we focus a lot and we hear the stories that uh, we're not doing what needs to be done when it comes to education, what we can do better. And I understand that. And we're making the investments and I'll talk a little bit about that. But what I've always said is that while well, we focus so much on student achievement and we focus so much on student proficiency, that we should never forget the impact of what it means for student engagement. And what that means at every single level, early childhood, K-12, higher ed, and even adult basic education. And what that means to have the opportunity to reimagine how that can look like, because student engagement means family engagement. Family engagement means community engagement. And community engagement goes beyond the walls or whatever the territory is of that particular higher ed institution. The reality of it is that we are all in this together. And under Governor Michelle Leon Grisham, we have worked extremely hard to make sure to provide the resources where educators are gonna be well compensated, but to provide the resources so that way we can give for research, for opportunities for collaboration, and the opportunity for network for the engagement success that we want. If COVID taught us anything during that time, even though we couldn't be together, didn't mean we couldn't stand together and then we couldn't work together. And that meant us and state government as well. Having to have this opportunity to have every one of our agencies work together in collaboration. And the reality of it, it seems like that would have been common sense and common practice, but it wasn't. In reality of it, we had many agencies for generations, for decades in state government that may have been working in isolation. We learned through COVID that the importance of working in collaboration while well, understanding and respecting the different cultures that we have in this state, valuing and celebrating the languages, the food that we bring, the opportunity to learn from one another, that's what today means. And that's where Tim, we talk about it for years of how this can look like. And so I'm grateful that we're able to have an opportunity to re-collaborate, to relaunch, to find ways to have this engagement aspect that surrounds the whole state of New Mexico. I'm excited about that because I know that there's more work that has to be done. And I know that there's gonna be more efforts that are gonna be made. But I want you to know in my role here as Lieutenant Governor, as a former student of the University of New Mexico, as a student of the state of New Mexico, that I'm here to provide that support, to take what it is that you're able to learn from here, the collaboration that you're able to bring and the ideas of how we're able to make this state better working together. You have my commitment to find the support, to find the political will to make sure that we're gonna to continue to invest in the people in our state. And there's nothing that makes me more proud than to have the opportunity to be able to do that for the state that I was born, raised, educated in, and hope to retire. I look back and see what that means with community engagement, and in many ways, it's family. And that impact of what that means for family. For those teachers, those Sunday school uh, volunteers, those coaches, those Cub Scout, Boy Scout, Girl Scout volunteers that were out there, 
all those that made a difference, made an impact on people's lives. We have to be able to value and to highlight, and most importantly, to organize it in a way that we can highlight whatever's taking place in jail, New Mexico, is also could be in collaboration with what's gonna happen in Farmington. And whatever's happening in the Lord River, New Mexico, is also celebrated and learned from in Taos. And these are the opportunities that we have through this process today. The best pieces of legislation that I've ever carried with the most impact have always come from what if. What if the opportunity and the possibility that we can have of thinking things differently? What if we can make a difference in lives across the state by just approaching it from a different viewpoint that it's not about me, but it's about all of us? That's what I see with this potential today. To see now that we have more historic revenues than we've ever had in the state of New Mexico. And that's not gonna stop anytime soon. But those revenues only go so far if there's not the vision and there's not the will and there's not the collaboration to make it a reality that's gonna have generational impact. I believe that the work that's gonna be done starting here will have generational impact and will continue to have an impact across our state. So we want to make a difference. We want to be change makers. I believe that you're doing it by coming here today, coming up with ideas and finding ways to say, what if we can do it a certain way? So thank you for allowing me the opportunity to come in. I apologize that I can't say the whole time, but I look forward to hearing the first panel and hearing some of the discussions that I can take with me and that we can continue to collaborate because the state needs to be a partner. Higher ed needs to be a partner. Our community schools need to be partners and together we can make this happen. Thank you. Well, I'm not gonna put this on because I'm gonna have to hand it over. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's awesome to, to talk about family. Um, yeah, I guess you're closer to Tyson than my age, right? My, that's my brother. Um, so anyway, um, well, we're going to get started with our first panel. I'm going to introduce my uh, my colleague, my very close colleague, almost feel like family, uh, Manuel Montoya from the Department of Economics. He's going to he's going to moderate this first uh, first panel. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Manuel. For me, thank you. I, I hope you're all doing very well. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Provost Holloway. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I appreciate all of the words uh, that you've shared. Uh, today, we're going to try our very best to initiate what we hope is an ongoing conversation regarding the status of community engagement and also uh, structural pathways and strategies for moving forward to making the university more intelligent and embedded in the concept of community engagement. Community engagement is such a difficult concept to wrap around because communities are varied in the ways that they emanate, the ways that we interact. There are so many different uh, elements and pathways to engaging authentically with communities. And we're very fortunate to have a group of people who are every day considering the various ways in which we show up into the world as authentically engaged people and that care about the state of New Mexico and the more particularistic ways in which we belong to New Mexico. So uh, I, I, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Cristina Lucero. Uh, she's the director of Southwest New Mexico Council on Government. Uh, also with us is Erin Callahan. She's the, the deputy village administrator for the village of Los Luna. Uh, Dr. Uh, Patricia Trujillo, she's the acting secretary for the New Mexico Higher Education Department, and uh, Directora Celeste Nunez, uh, she works with Key Station and also with the New Mexico Trade Alliance as director of international business resources. Uh, please give them a round of applause. I'm not very good. My my hearing is a little uh, wonky. Uh, so can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So uh, to begin, we're going to, uh, in their own words, have them introduce the type of community engagement that they do. And uh, they're going to present on their work uh, briefly. 
for about uh, seven to 10 minutes, everybody's going to introduce the, uh, the journey they've taken to be uh, change makers and supporters of New Mexico community engagement. Uh, and then afterwards, we have a series of questions that are trying to get at how community engagement can be done uh, more sustainable, more resiliently, and also more authentically in the way that we move forward. So, uh, uh, Directora Lucero, if you uh, would like to begin. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to come here today. Um, what an honor it is for me to be here today, and most importantly, because I come from a most rural, low-income area in Silver City, Grant County, and um, it wasn't until probably 10 years ago that I found out that, that the Lieutenant Governor and I lived in the same neighborhood and never knew that. Right, and so what an honor was for me to really understand and where we all come from that place of knowing what community is. But I think for me, um, if anybody knows anything about me, it's about, I'm all about community. And the reason I can say that and why I say that with such passion comes from the point that when I was raised in a low income um, neighborhood, we didn't have those amenities that everybody else had. But what it does do, it shows us how we want to live our lives in a much better form or fashion. And so I dedicated my life to ensuring that the most rural and frontier communities in which I'm making drastic change every day to improve the quality of life for people. That does not come easily, even if you come from a low-income neighborhood. Um, even though they know you and they know your parents, it still didn't come easily. I think in my first 10 years of my career, um, took about those 10 years to develop the relationships with the elected officials, with the local people, understanding the community character. And if you can't understand the community character and build the trust within those communities, you can't foster those opportunities. And that's no different whether it's local, whether it's regional, whether it's state, whether it's national. We have to establish those relationships. So what I favor the most is really Tim's story about coming back and wanting to give back. And I think that's what we're all here about today is really wanting to give back to our communities, to our people, to our state. I don't think it's any different for any of us, but I do have a story about Tim. <laughs> Somebody wanted a story. <laughs> so, and I am older than Tim. So, but how I got to meet Tim, and this is when I was a shy girl, and Tim and I got the opportunity while we were in high school to work for the Bus Driver Institute, where all the bus drivers were being trained in Silver City. We had one week of advanced drivers and one week of, uh, which was the beginner drivers. And let me tell you what an event it was. For two weeks in our community, what an economic driver that was, how we learned about all the different cultures that came to bus drivers and how we got put on the map as a result of that bus driver institute. And that's where I got to meet Tim. So I'm very honored that I get to be a part of Tim's team to be able to foster these opportunities. So I wanna share a few of the examples on why it's so important to be community engaged in these local um, governments. And that is a couple of examples that I can give Nothing happens overnight. We can't do it alone. It takes a team. But one of those opportunities is where his students that he mentioned earlier came to Silver City and gave us some economic opportunity ideas. And one of those was actually implemented in a village um, of about 1,500, which was to actually construct a splash pad. And that is in Grand County. That Splash Pad now attracts all kids from all the local governments within the county and has really fostered, fostered more opportunity and cleanup and revitalization of that community with more potential to bring in and enhance their tax base. Let me tell you what that means to that area it has been astronomical and what it means to the children themselves and how we foster those um, things to be able to make a change in their own lives. The other um, one I want to mention is one around um, really taking our natural amenities and that is um, being able to develop trails. And Tim was brought into a conversation developing as students are conceptual about how we take advantage of the trails within the town of Silver City and how do we continue that momentum to create outdoor recreation opportunities within our community. We've done exactly that and that continues. We continue to use his modeling of how we do that so we can get interconnect now we're connecting 
the Continental Divide Trail coming through the town of Silver City, then going, and now we have an 1887 Waterworks Building, which is the original water site for the town of Silver City that is now going to be the Continental Divide Trail trailhead with campsites, et cetera. And it continues to bring many people to our community. And we saw a lot of that during COVID where people came here and never left um, because they loved it so much and those opportunities of being able to be outside. As we, next year in 2024, we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the very first wilderness, which is the Gila Wilderness. And that's one of our natural beauties right in the state. Um, the last one I really want to talk about and how we come to and to talk about a partnership. And this is a partnership between Tim and the students, the lieutenant governor, legislators, local governments within a Grant County. And is that we are now in the final stages of design for a recreation facility that that will be providing these opportunities for the youth, seniors, adults, underserved, low income, for all populations. Those are the things that we as children wish we would have had the opportunity to take advantage of them. But now what we strive for is to give those opportunities to others, right? And, and to our children and to our grandchildren as we move forward. That recreation facility is set to start in January, the construction in January. And one of the things that I really liked about when um, Tim students did that for us, not only did they look at the different amenities and different ways to construct that facility, we captured many ideas from his students, but also look at the economic impact of that and what it meant to our community. And there's always more to that story, right? So moving forward, um, I wanna say as a university in my career, I've utilized Tim and his work and students. Mm -hmm. I've utilized the UNM, Health and Sciences Group. I've utilized the Data Research Center, everything from the Bureau of Business and Economic Research, really to help create opportunities and funding for my communities. I couldn't have done it without you and your services and your commitment to the jobs that you do every day. And a lot of times we don't take the time to acknowledge that. So from me to you, thank you for what you contribute. Thank you for what you contribute to the youth, to the students, and what now you're contributing to my communities. And I feel like now, in all my years of working this job, I don't feel like Silver City is just my community. It's the state of New Mexico is now my community, along with every other business and institution there is within this state. So help me to help continue that effort as we continue on to do more work with all of you as partners to engage uh, in all aspects of the community. Thank you. So now we'll hear from uh, Administrator, Administrator Callahan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Montoya. And I do have some slides. Should I come to the podium? Yeah. Okay. yeah, sure. Okay. 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 Thank you. I, I work in local government, um, so I have to do a lot of uh, council meetings, so I'm most comfortable behind a podium standing. <laughs> uh, so my name is Erin Callahan. I'm the Deputy Village Administrator for Los Lunas, New Mexico. I, uh, like, um, unlike many of my colleagues here, I am not born in New Mexico, but I am raised here. My family's been here since I was six years old. Um, I grew up in the Albuquerque area, and I went to UNM. So I've um, been really fortunate in the last 15 years to be um, engaged with the community client-driven projects at UNM through the School of Architecture and Planning um, in really every different capacity. And because of that, I've developed some, um, you know, really some, some opinions and best practices for how I think that those projects uh, work really well, um, how I've seen that go really well. So I would like to kind of share my experiences through my work and um, as a student, I'm working on some of these projects. So as some background, I, I graduated from Albuquerque High School in uh, 1999, right here in Albuquerque, uh, but it took me a really long time to go back to school and finish my bachelor's degree. And so I was not ready. Um, I didn't know what kind of different interesting jobs there were out there. Um, I really felt like you could do math, you could do science, STEM, maybe write papers. Um, but it wasn't until I took a long break and then came back and realized that 
there's a whole field of study called community planning or city planning where you might be able to use policies and design standards to help shape communities and hopefully make lives better for the residents that live there. So I enrolled here and got my bachelor's of arts in environmental planning and design uh, right here from the School of Architecture. Uh, I graduated in 2012. I rolled right into the master's in community and regional planning program, graduated in 2014. Um, raising kids in the meantime, I have an adult child and two teenagers. And um, after graduating in 2014, I was, uh, it was an interesting time to graduate because there were not a lot of jobs um, in the local governments. And so what I had heard from colleagues was that it was just a period of time where the economy was still recovering and that a lot of people were maybe one or two years away from retirement. And so there was just not a lot of turnover. So in the meantime, I took up some contract work with UNM uh, teaching classes. Um, so going right from being a student to uh, rolling into teaching. And then uh, shortly thereafter, I was hired by the village of Los Lunas, um, not my home community, but really excited to um, be considered to work there. I was their planner for four years. Um, after four years, uh, there was a, an opening. Uh, my great colleague, Christina Ainsworth, who's at Doniana County now, um, she moved on um, to Dona Ana, and then I uh, was hired to be her replacement as the community development director. And so that was a, an interesting position where now we get to kind of shape more of the policy and the direction of planning, economic development, code enforcement, uh, really interact with the local elected officials. And uh, just about a month ago, um, after a pretty successful time as community development director, I was promoted again um, to a new position in the village, the deputy administrator. So now we're working with a lot more uh, capacity building among different departments, uh, working with uh, public information, communications. And so I think that I'm now in, a, in an exciting position to have even more of an opportunity to shape how the village communicates with its residents. And because that's one of the biggest goals of having a deputy administrator is that someone will now just be in charge of communicating with residents, kind of sharing what we do, keeping an open line of you know, communication. So I'm just going to, I have a few slides, um, mostly pictures. And um, so I'm just gonna walk through some of the projects that I've worked on. Um, and I have a you know, few pictures here and there. As a student, um, I worked on a few, I actually, I, I left one out and um, we worked on, my first studio was with the uh, Mid-Region Council of Governments on the um, uh, multimodal transportation on Paseo del Norte um, before they put in the interchange. And that was a great studio. Uh, the other, um, that was a summer studio, the Rio Arriba Economic Development Plan, another summer studio. So these are kind of short-term projects um, it's not going on for months. We're taking just a little bit of time to interact with the agencies. We may be doing community meetings, um, but really it's kind of a kind of a short and fast turnaround, um, getting that exposure, um, getting the ability to present to um, different stakeholders. We had at the time when we did the um, the Paseo del Norte corridor project, we were our, you know, we felt that our bus routes, would be built. Um, that would be the result of the studio. And that's been a, an ongoing theme in studios I've been involved with uh, ever since that first studio. Um, it, you know, it turns out that it would, it would not be built and it was never going to be the alternative to building that interchange. The interchange was always going to happen. But the Council of Governments, um, they did, you know, our client told us, we will have to, you know, we, we're not gonna do these bus routes, but we do need to show that there is an alternative um, to building the interchange. Um, which is fair. I mean, that is how federal grant funding works sometimes. That's how transportation funding works sometimes as you need some kind of an alternatives analysis. As a student, a little bit discouraging that our, you know, our major, our beautiful plans would not come to fruition. But as a government uh, moving into the government role, it's definitely, uh, now I see that as a wonderful project to have students do because we're really not experts yet um, that can actually go through and um, build these projects. Um, in longer studios, I worked on the Route 66 studio, uh, which was a partnership with City Lab, and then also the Zuni Pueblo Main Street plan was our advanced planning studio. And so those were longer term projects, really got to build a, you know, a more significant relationship 
with the community. So those were um, really exciting projects to work on as a student. As an instructor, the first studio um, that I worked on was, uh, it was the undergrad studio for planners and we built an interactive play area for the Partnership for Community Action. So that was uh, very interesting to step out of the student role and work on shaping the students' understanding of how to pull a project together. Um, they had eight weeks to do their project. And one of the things that I had wanted to bring into the studio was how can we guide these students to feel like they're kind of working as a, as a, as a team. So when you're working in an office or you're working as a team, not everyone is going to be all trying to do the same thing and kind of, you know, fighting for the glory of, you know, everybody's has the most important research. Some people will need to be in charge of finalizing posters and some people will need to be doing editing and some people need to be making phone calls. And so we split the work up and they got a really great, I think, experience in learning how an office might function and how you're still contributing to that larger good, even though you might be doing the most glorious part of the project. Uh, recently, this past spring, um, I came back and taught, uh, co-taught with Michael Pride and Catherine Harris, the DPAC um, studio. So we worked on the Hermit's Peak Half Canyon Fire Recovery and Resilience Plan. Um, really very interesting project. Um, we were, uh, Manuel was very involved in this project. Uh, again, a fascinating studio. Uh, also really tried to give the students the understanding of what it's, what you know, what you're kind of expected to produce in the real world. Um, but one of the most kind of fun things that we got to do was I have all, now also been the client uh, for these studios. And we, with the Village of Los Lunas, we had students um, work for three different studios on a Route 66 museum plan and on a property that the village purchased. And so that included a plan, a historic preservation inventory and architectural designs. That was through the an NEA Our Town grant. We partnered with UNM on this project, and we were able to, you know, bring some funding to not just Los Lunas, but also to uh, the university, um, build some recognition for our projects, and also, you know, give a number of students some different experiences. So uh, these are just an example of some of the. This was the planning students' work. Um, the historic preservation uh, did some. They analyzed a historic building. Um, they did a very detailed inventory and then a little bit of planning for us. And then the architecture students came together and um, at the very end did some really interesting conceptual designs for the site. So, you know, as typical with architecture, we have many different designs, um, some of them, you know, pretty wild and some of them, um, you know, really, you know, pretty feasible for something that the site could look like. So just to kind of uh, some takeaways from all of these different experiences is that as students, uh, we really wanna feel like we're making a difference. So students wanna feel like they, they know that their projects are gonna mean something to somebody and they don't yet necessarily know that there are a lot of real life policies, politics, other constraints that might mean that actually the project is not gonna get implemented the way we thought it would, but that doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't a good project. It's not because they did um, bad work, it's because they, they the real world says, actually, this is not the number one budget priority, or actually, it turns out that this, you know, unfortunately, this historic building is in very, very bad shape. And because it's not a funding priority, it is not going to remain uh, where it is, uh, which unfortunately happened with our historic preservation inventory building. Um, but that doesn't mean it didn't mean something to us. It did help us to understand um, what could be done on the whole site. Uh, clients, we, I would, you know, I would say that anybody who's interested in being a client for a student project, there are so many different interesting things that students could do. So get creative and talk to your universities, talk to UNM about potential projects and see where there's a good fit for that to happen. And also just understand student capacity and level of expertise. So they're probably not going to be, um, obviously architecture students are not ready to do stamped plans, but they are ready to do really great visioning plans where you can say, okay, this narrows down our goals for this site. Um, and then don't necessarily wait for a full project to be funded. Just visioning research is really important. 
And finally, as a professor, it's just, um, it's, it's such a key bridge to managing expectations between students and clients. And so establishing really clear goals up front to say, yes, this is what we, you know, this is what we expect our, our this is what our students can produce for you. They can't really, they can't go to here, but they can do a great job right here. And then also let the students know this is how you are going to, this is where exactly you fit in into this community. Um, and then just help, uh, I would say also to UNM, you know, professors, not just clients out there, you know, go ahead and call UNM, but I would love to see UNM reach out and kind of have a way that other um, local governments or local organizations know to contact UNM. Um, I know because I was a student. Um, but not everybody knows, and so I'd love to see that um, be uh, facilitated. And with that, I will hand it back over. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to get a uh, perspective from uh, uh, Acting Secretary uh, Trujillo. Secretary Trujillo. Thank you, Brown. Good afternoon. My name is Patricia Brazil, and um, because this is a community-based conversation, I want to start with the question that you would get in my home community, which is uh, the Don't the Canadas, where are you from and who are you from? <laughs> and so I was born and raised in Espanola, New Mexico. Uh, my parents are native to the Brazil. They were both um, bilingual educators. Um, my grandmother was also a bilingual educator, so I have a very unique positionality in northern New Mexico of being a third generation college educated Chicana. And I feel like that's an important story to tell, right? Because first and foremost, we know we always want to serve the most vulnerable and that the majority of our students are first generation, but there are also others of us who have different stories. And as we start to talk about that generational impact, it's important for people like me and my family to tell their stories as well. And so um, I'm really glad to say that my niece just graduated about two years ago. You're from UN, so she's the fourth generation. And so it was really my grandmother who started that tradition of education in our family, but also in our community. My grandmother taught for four years at Hernandez Elementary School, uh, which was an elementary school, literally a stone throw from where she uh, was raised, and that where I have the great privilege to still live. I live in a family house. Um, I'm an indigenous descendant, um, land-based Chicana from northern New Mexico, which is to say that in this lifetime, I'm not a tribal member, but the, the house that I live on is on the Yuke Yuke, or the Ispano side of the Yuke Yuke um, land. And so this is to give some context about the complexities of the community that I live in, where I come from, and that I serve. Um, and so before I get to the conversation about the work we're doing in the higher education department, I really want to speak about my positionality as a scholar um, from Espanol in New Mexico. Uh, I went to New Mexico State. So back in the day, I think still, I, uh, still there was a bit of a are you going to cannabis? You are going to the university near mom. And so in that time. Yeah. Went to New Mexico State. Um, and where, you know, I got an undergraduate degree in English and law and society. I really thought I was going to go on the path to being an environmental attorney. Um, but I really fell in love. And I think just, you know, when I actually just let my gifts settle in, uh, uh, the concept of storytelling and studying literature. And so for me, that is, you know, where I went from. Then I went on to the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, where I got an MFA in fiction and then a PhD in U.S. Latin and Latino literature at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And something that that pathway really taught me uh, was it's really hard to live in the Midwest and to go to an NWI, right, a predominantly white institution. And so I really sought out a Hispanic serving institution for my PhD experience. And that was one of the best decisions I could have made. And what I would offer to this audience in terms of thinking about, you know, uh, community engagement at the university is that UTSA is a premier HSI in um, in the country right now, um, not just in, you know, the food fund and DSS aspect, but also in the programs that they're developing um, to serve uh, Hispanic communities. And so I would offer that in this state, right, we have more opportunity. We also have four tribal colleges. We have five Native American non tribal serving institutions. So we have a lot of opportunity to think about what does cultural relevancy look like in higher ed. 
Um, but for me, what it was is it built a dedication to, and the really great thing about the UTSA program is um, that it specifically trained professors to work at HSIs. So that concept of what does it mean to serve in communities like Espanola, New Mexico, was embedded into our course of study. And I took that very seriously as being a community-based educator and um, activist scholar is that um, uh, I'm what we would call a returner, right? In higher ed, uh, we usually, usually train people to be nomads. You go to chase the job and usually at the R1s. Um, and uh, for me, my goal was always to make it back to Northern New Mexico College in Española, to, despite, you know, the, the, how do I say, the protests of my dissertation committee who had that other dream for me. Um, my dream was really, I wanted to come home and utilize um, the skills that I had worked on in community in San Antonio, Texas, um, uh, to come and, and, and establish myself at my hometown institution. And, uh, and that was really interesting uh, in terms of how we build community in higher ed. One of the first things that happened to me is that my friends who had different aspirations disappeared from my academic life. Um, and I heard a lot of negativity, uh, uh, like, you know, Northern's not a place where you go to have a career, it's where you go to retire. You know, um, Northern is not a place uh, where people are going to take you seriously as an academic. And so very early on, I had to dig deep um, because being an academic and having the academic lifestyle was very important to me. And so was being able to live in my home community and have my family uh, be able to be raised, right, uh, where I was born and raised. This, and, and that is saying a lot because if you're from New Mexico, you understand that Española is often a Milani community. When we hear about it often in the media, we hear the negative perspectives of Espanola. And for me, you know, I always wanted to come from that asset base. You know, my family had been there um, for centuries. Uh, my dad's family is from Taos. They had been there for centuries. And for me, you know, I could see the struggles. I, I don't deny them, but it's also a place of multiplicity. It's a beautiful place where, you know, families thrive, where we know each other, where we support each other, the good kinds and bad. And so for me, I really wanted to center that at the core of my academic experience. Um, so um, a colleague and I are actually in the process of, uh, of editing a collection. It's called, um, I can't even remember our book title, <laughs> uh, The Geography of Spain, Home and Place in the Academy. Um, and it's basically a collection of personal narratives of scholars from New Mexico who were born and raised in New Mexico who have uh, and their pathway back to home or how they've had to like recreate or reimagine um, how it is that they can use their credentials, you know, in higher ed in New Mexico if the pathway doesn't lead directly to an institution. And so um, I'm really proud of that. That collection has been a long time in coming, but really at the heart of it, right, is that so many of the messages um, that students like myself, right, Manitos, Native American students, Chicano students in Northern New Mexico get, is that if you're bright and people see that you have potential, the message we get over and over again is you have to get out of here. If you want to be successful, you have to live here. And we really want to interrupt that narrative. We want people to say, no, guess what? You can be bright and successful and live in your home communities. And in fact, we need you to, right? In terms of economic development, um, in terms of workforce, but also in terms of having futures for our communities. Um, we we run our community. They are what we want them to be. And so for me, I've always said I don't have a research agenda. I have a place agenda. And so working at Northern New Mexico College got very involved uh, initially as a professor of English and Chicano studies, but then as the founding director of the University in community organizing. So an example that I would love to share with you all um, is. Uh, some colleagues, some students, and some community members uh, just kind of started tossing around an idea in 2012 um, because we saw uh, um, that the state was hosting a centennial symposium, you know, a, a, a historical symposium on statehood. And when we looked at the lineup, there were very few, um, and I, I don't want to misspeak, but I think I'm remembering that there were no, no. <laughs> Uh, uh, his final voices, Native American voices in that uh, um, official state symposium. 
So the community got together and we started what we call the Historia del Nuevo México or the New Mexico Histories Conference. And what we did in the framework of that conference is that uh, we invited academics to participate, but we also invited our community members to participate. And we really um, put a lot of value on when you would have a patch like this, you know, having equal voices on that panel from the community and from the academy. Um, uh, if we had, you know, keynote speakers, everybody got paid at the same rate and every speaker got paid because it was that idea that we weren't going to value academic voices over community voices um, as we talked about statements. So uh, it was a very successful conference. Um, and also at smaller institutions, you don't always have the same kind of even access to being able to write grants, right? Uh, and so we couldn't commit to doing the, the conference on a, you know, on a cycle. So we took a page from La Academia de la Nueva Raza, which was a, a educational um, collaborative that came out of Angulo, New Mexico in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, they had a um, uh, academic journal that they published in community called, um, uh, what was it? Paderno de vez en cuando, so like the, the, the journal that would get published when it gets published. So then we would call our, we call our conference, the conference de vez en cuando. Um, and it was really when community comes together and asks for this conference, we will do what we can to put our resources together um, and make it happen. So again, in 2017, uh, we had our second Sonia's conference, and that one was around um, the Native American and Hispanic narratives of Manhattan Project employees, um, because at that time, the National Park Service was coordinating the Manhattan Project um, National Museum. It was going to be at the three sites um, where the Manhattan were, you know, the unfortunate history of the bomb came together. Um, and uh, what we do in our community is that Hispano and Native American community members had been critical to the success of that project, but that was something that was not being shared as part of that larger narrative. Um, and so for me, personal connection, my grandmother was one of the women who worked for the Manhattan Project. So then what we did is we started getting community together. Um, and we had a very successful conference in 2017 where we got um, the, as many of the last remaining employees um, awarded them, you know, uh, uh, basically, um, we call them community storyteller awards. But just to basically give them that gravitas to say that they were a critical and important part of this history, um, we were able to bring um, a story for like, uh, you know, recording booth to record those stories, but to essentially create an archive of these stories that represent our communities. And then um, in terms of the community engagement piece that continues on is that community members who got very involved in the process of organizing that uh, uh, conference uh, remained and became advisory board members to the National Park Service to make sure that the Native American and Hispanic stories are a part of that National Museum. And so those are those interventions when you have a place agenda um, that you can really work with. But uh, as I was telling Manuel earlier, is in many ways I chose to kind of live as a scholar outside of a tenure system, you know, uh, Northern New Mexico College is a teaching institution. Um, uh, it's relatively young in the four-year um, realm. And so, you know, it's also growing. It's figuring out, you know, what, what it wants to be as an institution. Um, but for me, uh, and something that I'm thinking about in this book project and that I'm writing about, is the concept of community-based tenure. Like, what, what does that mean? And so after this Historias conference, which had really been organized by this man named uh, Willie Atencio and some other uh, families who had been really impacted. Willie's dad literally drove the buses that would drive through all the pueblos up north and through all the small villages to pick up the employees to drive them up to um, the, the Manhattan Project. Um, and so they, they cared very deeply. It was a stake to their family, to their communities. Um, and so, uh, you know, it came to pass, it was a success. And, you know, probably a week or so later, I was walking up to my car and there were literally just bushels of apples around my car. And um, somebody just left a note and it said, really didn't know if you like green, uh, yellow apples or red apples. And so then for me, like those are those moments where I'm like community tenure, right? Like I'm never going to want for apples again. <laughs> and, and, and just the way that um, how sometimes we know that that we have to make our own personal decisions. And for me, 
working at the small community-based institution in my hometown uh, was something that I wanted to um, have as part of my work um, in, in terms of thinking about this HSI community. What does it mean to serve Hispanic students? What does it mean to serve Native American students? It's you go where they are. And so um, I will just uh, sum up by saying that I've always you know, believed in centering the community. I believe in the fact that we can live in the communities that we were raised in and that we can be and are an important part of their futures. Um, and the other piece here is that we don't build relationships that allow us to do the work. Relationships are the work, right? Um, and so I'm really glad to say that now in 2025, we're going to be having our third Estonia conference, and it's going to be the theme of 100 years of Espanola, um, bringing people together from the community to under, uh, to celebrate um, the 100 years of township. A lot of times people think Espanola is a much older community than it is, but it's actually the surrounding communities around it that have that longer historical posterity. Um, and so it's going to give us a really great opportunity as a community to address that. But also this work for, for me has always been about healing work, right? Uh, we know that unfortunately there was just a shooting in Espanola um, where somebody who was peacefully protesting a statue of Oñate Boya got shot. And so, you know, there are material circumstances and material consequences um, to not doing community this work. And so for me, I would just offer um, that, you know, um, public history, storytelling, community health narratives, are all a part of that. And so with that, I will make a brief connection to uh, the work that we've been doing at the Higher Education Department, which is with the passage of the New Mexico, New Mexico Opportunity Scholarship, right? Um, in addition to the tuition free college work that we had already done with the lottery scholarship, New Mexico now has the most robust tuition free program in the nation. And what that literally means, again, in that those material circumstances and the ways that we're changing lives is that 40,000 students have been able to utilize tuition free um, college in the last two years. And not only that, in that over the last two years, we've been able to increase enrollment across the state, uh, across all higher ed institutions by uh, about 7%. And so we are doing things in our state, in our little state that could, <laughs> um, um, that nobody else in the nation is accomplishing right now. And so when we do our best, right, to have that community centeredness, when we're thinking about serving the most vulnerable, when we're thinking about how are we creating policies that are the most equitable, um, really what we're doing is where, like if that rising tide raises all ships. And um, for us at the New Mexico Higher Education Department, we're constantly thinking about that. You know, uh, we have it written on all of our whiteboards, but also, you know, as we can go into the politics and to all of, um, you know, um, oftentimes um, many different perspectives and sometimes conflicting point of views, we always come back to the center of students, families, and communities. Um, to make sure that we're centering ourselves in that place to think about how we serve um, and our servingness comes from that from that center place of, uh, of, of students, families, and community. And I think I've run over my time, so I will pause there and do <laughs> You can tell me to switch them if you want. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Celeste Núñez Salcido. I just got married. Oh. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm just here. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, So I prepared a presentation. Um, I have a lot of photos to share with you all, so I'll try to move with this as quickly as possible. But community impact, I, I want to first thank you. Thank UNM, thank Tim Castillo, thank Dr. Montoya, um, Provost, Lieutenant Governor, and my fellow panelists. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about a topic I find very important, uh, something that has always been on my mind. Uh, similar to uh, Lieutenant Governor, I am from a large family, so community engagement is something that I didn't choose to first think about. It was in place on me because of my siblings. 
Um, yeah, so my name is Celeste Nunez Salcido. I am the Director of International Business Resources with an organization called the New Mexico Trade Alliance. And uh, my responsibility is to connect local New Mexico companies with uh, local, regional, state, national, and international uh, trade resources. Um, I'm first generation. I'm the first of my family to graduate from college. Um, I'm one of five. Uh, my parents are from Mexico, and I was born in Las Cruces, so go southern New Mexico. But for me, NMSU was University of Vermont. So I am a, I am a, I'm a Lobo. I was a uh, presidential scholar. I was involved with uh, El Centro de la Raza, uh, with International Students Business Global, um, Korean Club, ASUNM. So uh, that need for community here in Albuquerque when I didn't have any family was was so important for me that I sought out different groups within the university to, to belong to. And I feel like that approach to life of community has just sustained with me ever since. I wanted to take a second to, I, to define what community impact meant to me. And these are my words. It's the conscious decisions we make, the intentional actions we take to address and change our collective experience of the world. Actually, through UNM, I took a uh, social impact community engagement course, and I learned about something called the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which are a set of 17 global goals for the United Nations adopted by all the member states um, as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. They're a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all. Here's an image of all of those goals. And they can kind of be organized into the, these peaks, people, prosperity, planet, peace, and partnership. And as I was thinking about what community engagement and development meant, I looked at what I do in my career and what, what piece I fall into. And in this presentation, I would really like to focus on prosperity, partnership, and people. Well, how my work with economic development relates to prosperity, how partnership, how we work with exchange, uh, cultural understanding, collaboration, and with people, career development, and civic participation. So in this presentation, I'll be organizing the work that I do in Community Impact to these three tiers. So let's get started. <laughs> Prosperity. Um, alongside here, uh, one of my panelists, I also work in economic development. So economic development you know, is, is the area of focus well, uh, looking at to stimulate economic growth, create jobs, enhance infrastructure, and raise living standards. Uh, trade and export assistance is inherently an economic development effort. Mm, and with the organization that I work, uh, like I mentioned, we are a, a nonprofit. We are funded by the city of Albuquerque, uh, Bernalillo County, and the state of New Mexico in their economic development departments, as well as the Air Force Research Lab as it relates to aerospace development. Um, and what we mainly do is we work with small businesses to help them export. Why is this important? When a company is exporting, they're actually growing faster, they're more profitable, they're more resilient, they're creating new jobs, and it's something good for our state. Our mission is to drive economic development by expanding New Mexico's global connectivity. How do we do that? How do we assist exports? Well, in these categories, which I will go through briefly, um, company consultations. We actually meet with small businesses one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, or either through Zoom, and we talk about the trade challenges that they're facing. Um, we try to serve as a clearinghouse for any topic related to international uh, business. And if we don't have the expertise to support them, we work with our community partners. This is somewhere where I'm really grateful for UNM because the uh, UNM in partnership with the City of Albuquerque and the Fulbright program developed a export uh, diagnostic tool, export readiness tool that companies can log on, use, and just kind of assess where they're at in terms of export readiness. Um, it was awesome actually to have two Fulbrights from Mexico uh, working on this project and then now a, a third one. So this tool that came out of uh, UNM is, is being used today in the real world for New Mexico. We also do educational events. Um, sometimes they're industry specific, sometimes they're country specific. 
Um, and we try to bring that market intelligence to New Mexico companies so that they can make informed decisions as they look to the global marketplace. Um, we try to be engaged in these. So as here you can see, we participated in the Black Business Summit. Uh, last week, uh, we actually were in the Hispanic Business Summit. Um, the Native Edge Institute program. We, we try to find those different niches of businesses, not just the Albuquerque metro area, but all areas of the state so that exporting is something available to all companies here. And this is uh, you know, the Sandia Civitan Club. Uh, we can issue export documents, but I won't talk about that too long. <laughs> and um, one of the main ways that we support companies is actually by organizing trade missions. And that's actually facilitating companies to go to those international marketplaces and meet buyers, either at a trade show or through organized uh, pre-arranged uh, business meetings. Um, oftentimes, these are accompanied by an elected official, which is great for companies because they fall under that credibility of the U.S. government and they're able to have better meetings and uh, better opportunities. Um, one that I want to highlight in 2023 was the Mexico City one. We're actually preparing it in, uh, in December for a Japan trade mission. Here are images from Mexico City. Um, as part of that, you know, the companies, we were able to take five companies um, to meet with um, with the free range uh, business meetings, but also the government was able to have meetings in uh, their economic development areas of focus. This is images from a trade mission, a trade show in Germany um, focused on outdoor recreation. And this one was the Florida International Medical Expo. But I really wanna highlight one of the main tools that we have to support our, com our companies, which is the NM Step Grant. The State Trade Expansion Program Grant is an SBA funded program that's awarded to the state's economic development department. We're the administering program of it, and it's a reimbursement grant program. It basically helps companies pay for the activities to export. Um, again, why is it important? 95% of the consumers outside the US. The, co the grant covers a variety of activities. It can be used for companies to exhibit at trade shows, uh, website optimization, business matchmaking. But what we've seen from this program uh, is companies being able to offset that that kind of entry cost, that that difficult cost that it takes to exhibit at a trade show could cost thousands of dollars and meet with potential clients. And as a result, uh, for example, we had one company out of uh, Roswell, New Mexico that used it to translate their website and then within a week, they were getting leads from the marketplace that they had they had translated to, and um, they used it for business re business matchmaking and were able to land a deal with the Malaysian government. So this grant program is is incredibly impactful and helps companies grow. Um, foreign relations. I wanted to tie into uh, the work that I do with economic development, but you'll see it also translates to partnerships. Uh, we manage the foreign relations for the city of Albuquerque. And that means that when a foreign uh, government delegation is here to meet with uh, the city, we arrange that and coordinate that and support to get them the right uh, meetings that they're looking for. And as a result of these, we've been able to forge partnerships that then we can leverage with our small businesses. Um, here you'll see us meeting with the Chinese consulate, um, Chihuahua uh, Commission, um, and uh, Guadalajara. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our impact. So since 2020 till through 2022, uh, New Mexico Trade Alliance has assisted five over 500 companies. Some of these might be repeat, but for different projects, uh, generated over 620 leads. Uh, uh, organizers supported over 70 international trade development seminars, supported inbound and outbound trade missions 124, and related to the STEP grant, over $500,000 to New Mexico companies since 2021, generating 3.5 million in exports to the state. Now this figure has gone up because we now um, have used another 100,000 and we're just awarded another $200,000 from the SBA to support companies through export grants. Um, something that I did uh, before fully uh, walking into this role in international development was a uh, small business. I worked with the city of Albuquerque, uh, supporting small businesses, uh, supporting 
COVID grants and workforce development and Bernalillo County. And um, one thing that I'm really proud of was the $10 million small business grant that supported over 1,700 businesses during the pandemic. I want to touch the other topic of partnership and foreign relations, which are the bridges that we build between people that can really generate uh, um, friendships and opportunities. And one of the main uh, organizations that facilitates this is the Albuquerque Sister Cities Foundation. You can see the different sister cities that we have. And in fact, we've just added another one, Hard Key, Ukraine. Um, but I uh, work to support Guadalajara. So I oversee the relationship that the city has with the city counterpart in Guadalajara. And um, as I mentioned with Hard Key, Ukraine, this is a newly built sister city. And what has happened from this was actually the community came to the city saying, we see what's happening in Ukraine and we want to do something about it. And there was an expedited process to set up this, this specific um, The director of economic development, Max Gruner, actually visited Kharkiv, Ukraine, met with their mayor, signed the proclamation. And as a result, we're pending uh, um, donating a, an ambulance with medical supplies to uh, Kharkiv. This is um, other foreign region maybe. <laughs> um, and this is with Guadalajara. Um, we have connected city governments together, like I mentioned, but specifically departments. So as a result, we've had the Guadalajara Fire Department and Albuquerque Fire Department exchange uh, best practices, exchange um, organizational structures. Um, and in tourism, the Hispano Chamber of Commerce has met with the equivalent in Guadalajara. And as a result, the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce and the Guadalajara Chamber of Commerce have signed an MOU. And in fact, next week, there's gonna be a trade mission led by the Chamber of Commerce here in Albuquerque to Mexico City to continue fostering those relationships uh, and thereafter with Guadalajara. One thing that I'm really proud of though is Space Messengers. Space Messengers is an immersed mixed reality installation in international youth sustain program, exploring universe through art and science and technology. I've been talking about economic development and business, but I, I think that uh, the, the friendships that we forge through cultural understanding are super powerful and they can thereafter lead to those economic opportunities. And Space Messengers is an example of that. Um, it is basically a program that connects rural New Mexico high schools um, and in the previous year, Albuquerque High School with as high schools in other countries, this time with Guadalajara, and put these students together to learn about space to, together. And as they're learning about that, they capture those messages, those thoughts, those reflections, and creates this big installation where students get to see the manifestation of their education process. So we were super proud to connect with STEM Arts Lab, who oversees this program, and the US consulate in Guadalajara to bring four ambassadors to Albuquerque during the International Balloon Fiesta. And those four ambassadors were able to work on this program during the Balloon Fiesta and get to meet their counterparts here in Albuquerque. We hope uh, to bring four Albuquerque students to Guadalajara in 2024. And here's some photos of, of the program. Um, another uh, thing that's happening with Sister Cities is uh, an inbound delegation of Turkmenistan dancers. Um, it's really powerful to see how arts and culture brings people together and, and, and creates those uh, conversations that can then develop to other economic conversations. Um, we had um, the um, a, a delegation of Turkmenistan meet with the city of Albuquerque and meet with their planning department to learn about their uh, mitigation strategies for um, uh, utility usage. And in fact, this delegation was also able to meet with UNM, the Global Education Office, uh, as they prepared to sign um, an agreement for student exchanges. Finally, I'd like to uh, kind of narrow this down. I don't know if you've noticed that we're narrowing this down to people, career development and civic participation. This is relating to skilling up and, and, and working with um, uh, people to connect them with resources. Now, one of the major ways that um, I do that is through Global Shapers Albuquerque. We are a hub under the World Economic Forum, the first built in New Mexico. We're basically, ambitious students looking to problem solve uh, our uh, challenges that we share here in Albuquerque. We're all from different areas of life. It's, it's a really interdisciplinary group that 
itself gets to govern what projects we pursue. As a result, we've actually started a voter registration project where we go out to the community and help help people register. It's important for me to mention that we are nonpartisan, um, but it's something that we believe in, that youth should be uh, engaged civically. And you can see kind of images of, of uh, Global Seekers Albuquerque, the way that we're uh, engaged. And, and something that I'd like to bring up is that as we develop these projects, we always look for uh, other stakeholders and other community participants that are doing the same work. So if there is a challenge that you're working on and you, uh, you could um, benefit from more capacity or more support through us, please reach out. We're always excited to meet other organizations. Finally, I think that um, I think that mentorship is incredibly important. I know that I wouldn't be where I am here now had it not been for the mentors that I had. So big brothers, big sisters, and it's incredibly important program to me. I think um, it's important for students with uh, less resources to learn about uh, networking and social capital so that we can imagine a future bigger than what we know. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention what I did during my undergrad at UNM. Um, as part of El Centro de la Raza, I'm working with CAMP, which is a college assistant migrant program. I um, worked with uh, migrant farm workers, and we were passionate about bringing awareness to the unjust conditions that these people face. So we organized the UNM Farm Worker Awareness Week, which is an event that keeps going. Um, but this was in 2019. We set it up in the sub so that as students were walking to get their lunches, and we could pull them aside and let them know, hey, do you know about migrant farm workers? Have you learned about their conditions? Did you know that uh, they face labor, um, labor, what's the word? labor sensitivities? And um, this was great to work with Recuerda uh, César Chavez Comité. Finally, I just like to uh, express how these different P's, prosperity, partnership people, but also the other ones that we saw from the SDGs, they're connected. The work that we do in one area is not silo. We don't work in vacuums. What we do here individually impacts what the other person perceives and receives, and then in the community as a whole. So I'm, I'm very thrilled to be a part of this panel. And I'm so thankful for the work that all the other panelists are doing, because I know that all the accomplish, accomplishments that they're making touches different areas of our life and in whole enhances our community as a whole. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vanessa. So, so as the lights come back on, uh, I have actually one fundamental question that I hope ties everything together. Uh, you've heard a lot, we've all heard a lot about uh, about the importance of place and the importance of relationships and people in the development and the way that we authentically engage with people. And uh, I'm reminded how how much how much work is already being done. Uh, let's give the round, a round of applause here for the work that they do. Uh, uh, well, I don't like how you're emotional about the kind of work that gets done, but it's, it's extensive and, uh, and it's hard. It takes a lot of time. And I was really moved by the concept of it happens when it happens. Because when, when we think about the way that communities uh, are developing, and that's a fraught word, development, um, becoming whatever it is that a community needs to become as it becomes in the world, I'm also wondering about the university. And I was once given an opportunity to see two different towers at a very old institution. One was the ivory tower, and the other one is the oft misunderstood ebony tower, which is, we know the ivory tower to be the tower of esoteric knowledge. It's the tower we sometimes call uh, institutions like universities, ivory tower institutions, when we want to say that they're out of touch with communities. But there is also aspects of the ebony tower, which is folk wisdom. It's the way that we connect to the world. It's the, the things we pass on to one another as popular wisdom or as as communal wisdom. And if I were to ask each and every one of you to reflect on the work that you do and the work you've heard your fellow panelists talk about, I would just ask a simple response to the following question. What is the work of the Ebony Tower 
what are those things that you do in the community that you think the university needs to adapt to or take and, and place dollarize or place in a position of acknowledgement and or recognition as being legitimate forms of research that we should hear about in this particular conference and symposium. And we'll begin with Director Lucero. Thank you for the question. And I, I wanna go back a little bit about some of the work that I've done to kind of answer that question, if I may. So a lot of my work, um, I'm gonna, like you, I didn't really know that I'd be in a planner um, initially, but I go back to the days of David and when he was in, and, and how he came back to the community and helped foster those opportunities. But a lot of my work and what I've done really came by chance in my opinion. Um, I, every day I get up and I work on water and wastewater. And I think one of the things that was really eye-opening for me as I started my career, how many people didn't have the basic needs met. Um, part of my work was working in the colonial communities along the border. Um, and how many of those were fearful of many other things, but not even having their basic needs met. So when I talk about fast forward, and now I'm starting my 37th year in this, in this organization, is that I am now seeing those things come back from what I started back um, almost 37 years ago and trying to just provide basic needs. And I think what um, I would like to say kind of regards to your question is that is that we need to take a better look and go back and really take a good hard look about number one, we're a rural state. I'm a rural region, but we're not really looking at what's happening in these most frontier communities to move them forward. And so when I talk about things, these are things that you're not gonna typically see because you don't see them here in the metropolitan area. So we have many, many rural challenges from everything from capacity, communities can't move forward because they have no capacity. They don't have anybody to help them. Um, it's me establishing relationships by bringing trust, by having a cup of coffee with them at the table. But when you can't even have good quality water because there's contaminants that are naturally occurring, we can't, we can't foster anything unless we have those basic needs. We can't foster anything if we can't provide adequate housing for these communities. And so what I see as what I've, what I've been able to do in my work, in my career, is, connect, is to begin to connect the dots at the local level, regional level, state level, to be able to advocate for those people with the greatest need. So I can relate to all the topics that have been talked about today and how we do that. That is not easy. Every day we get up and we endure so many different things to try to help foster opportunities because we're public servants. That's what we do every day. But none of it is easy and nobody knows all of the behind the scenes work that happens. So what I've got to say moving forward, and this is where, where I think we start at the local level, we have to really believe in ourselves, right, to say that we can make change and that we can connect the dots. So now what I do on top of that is I am now volunteering to be on state committees such as housing, uh, housing strategies, economic development, um, uh, planning, um, climate change, um, I'm also involved in everything that includes water and wastewater. I'm a water ambassador and all of those just so that I can speak for the people, for the people who can't speak for themselves, right? And there are many of those people that can't speak. But I'm gonna tell you as planners, as I consider myself a planner, is just trying to figure out how to implement those grant dollars that come to the communities, whether it's in education, whether it's in infrastructure, whatever it is, I do the application, but I don't do the grant administration. That is a challenge in itself. So I would say that we have to we have to take time as individuals, whether it's me understanding what happens at a metropolitan area and a state level, but also to understand from a metropolitan and educational level what happens at the local level because if we're not in tune to what's happening at the local level, we can't move our, our, um, our organizations forward or our people forward. So I'll just say this for myself and then I'll pass it on, is I wanna go back to what Celeste said for me. 
I didn't even know what an opportunity was for me because I wasn't exposed to those opportunities. All my only opportunity was for me to be in, in my life was the secretary. Here I am a director in my thoughts and, and whatever thought I do, and never thought I'd be what I am today. Sitting and working with the Lieutenant Governor, having a conversation with the provost, having a presentation presented to all of you who, in my opinion, do much more than I would do. So, so those are the realities from rural and frontier and how I see all of my colleagues here moving this state forward. Thank you. Thank you. I totally agree with um, what uh, Priscilla said about, you know, it's working and the challenges of working in New Mexico. There are a lot of communities without um, the capacity to advocate for themselves. And there are a lot of areas that are very disconnected from infrastructure. And it's really complicated to get infrastructure um, put out to places. So I work in Los Lunas, which is not really that far um, from Albuquerque, it's in the metro area, uh, but it is, uh, you know, we do work on infrastructure projects and they're not complicated. Um, but one of the things that I'd like to talk about is um, just kind of coming from UNM and coming from a planning program, there's an idea of what community engagement means that is, I, you know, I, I would have understood coming out of school is very much about planning interesting activities, it's developing long-range plans, um, it's holding events, um, it's all these different kind of, you know, maybe not continuous engagement opportunities, but we're doing a project, we're out there, we're trying to make it as, we're trying to get as much feedback as possible. Um, but moving into local government and having worked in local government for several years now, one of the things that I always come back to is that we do community engagement every day at the local government because anyone, we are the public. Um, like, a, you know, agree or not with the way that the United States is, you know, our government in the United States, we are a representative democracy. And so our elected officials are elected by their constituents. And we, as um, public servants who work for local government, are uh, we are really there to, we're not the decision makers, we're there to um, enforce and enact and explain the, um, the rules and regulations that have been developed um, by that community. And so we, I like to um, make sure that when I'm talking to students and when I'm working with my staff, um, that we really create a mindset that every interaction that we have with a member of the public, if somebody comes in and they say, I want to build a shed, is that okay? Um, what do I need to do to do that? Then when we sit down with them and we say, okay, let's, let's look for your property. Did you know that you can find our community maps online? Um, did you know that you can find this information about your zoning? We've made those public to you. Um, it can be really complicated to develop a site plan or know what should go into that. And here are some resources for you to help understand. Here's the key elements that you need to look at. Um, you know, calling people back, responding to emails. Um, every I see any opportunity that I have to talk to a local resident is um, it's one of the, my favorite parts of the job. And so I think that that's I would say that's an area where you know if the question is. What's something that maybe in the university that could, you know, we could look at to say, actually, this is a really valid form of community engagement. It's just kind of understanding that daily engagement um, that goes on um, that just becomes a part of our lives in this career. All right. Thank you. I, I really love this concept of the Evan Power, and I feel like it's the first time I've heard it articulated that way. So thank you for that. And we have scholars that, like I hang out with, we call friends. We always call it the Evan Power, right? Like, <laughs> and I think it, it's very much um, the same. So something that resonates with me um, in, in, in making your question on is, you know, I come from a family of Asequeros. So I come from Chantia, the Asequia, the Los Movinos, and House. Acerca de los alzares en el guache, en acerca de los civiles en el guache, también also. And, um, and so for me, even though I'm not the person who is currently farming um, in the sustainable ways that my family has farmed in for generations, it's something that I'm still a part of and I support. And also gives you those exemplars for how to live life. So when you think about like 
you know, when you think of what we call Sakamola, I said, yeah, the natural people come together annually um, to, uh, as a personate, you're a steward of the whole water line, and you are given a tarea, a homework, to go and clean a portion of it so that the asoka flows freely for the entire community who will be planting and you and irrigating that season. And so for me, um, those are always like the aspects of my culture that have become like like the lived metaphors of the way that I engage with my students and think about my classrooms. Um, there's a certain form of democracy there, and there are aspects to it that we have to question and 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 think about right deeply. Um, but that are really a part of, you know, um, when we're being uh, engaged with community and in higher ed institutions, like working with people in those familiar forms of leadership. So for me, when I was working at Northern New Mexico College, Northern New Mexico College is also on um, the Asia de los Indios, and it's the only one of the only I think it is the only higher ed institution um, uh, that has an Asia running through it. And so for me, that was a really big and important part of what should be, you know, land-based education. So something that we did at the time when I was working at Northern is a group of faculty members. We were all working on campus-wide student learning outcomes, um, but we took one on called uh, cultural sustainability. And so it was by the time students from Northern New Mexico, New Mexico College graduated, you know, they would have, you know, research and writing skills, they would have quantitative reasoning, they would have um, I forgot what, what the third one was, but then one of them, ours was cultural sustainability. And so in terms of thinking about how that traditional knowledge can really inform also like a, a systemic shift in what students um, can take with them, but also bring them, right? One of the most powerful places I've ever taught is at Northern, because you have students who come in from, you know, Eliasco and Pepos and Yataka and all the communities I was. There are many more uh, communities than that. Um, but, you know, a lot of times if they came into other bigger institutions, they might be coded or tagged as students who are not college ready. Um, but what I found in working with these students, that they are, have this amazing self-confidence that they of the world, right? So it's really beautiful to see these connections to um, international business and then also understand how New Mexico, even our small rural and frontier communities are already part of that greater global exchange and have been, you know, um, since time immemorial. And, and, and so I just get really excited to think about then how we can take a lot of these cultural metaphors and employ them within the institution um, to think of the ways that we also invite that ebony power uh, to be a part of, of the training. Because a lot of times we have students from frontier, rural, and public community. Oh, down? Yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Is um, that they're going to institutions to be changed, but we forget that institutions are also changed by the students who come here and interact with us. Thank you. No, it's like the 1970s uh, punk movement. Like, you know, like, you know, they kind of like talk around like Zach and Roger. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm just going to say that. I agree. Yeah. It's still in the mind. Um, and we go back to actually my career at the university, and the first is getting involved. I want to be very interested in that, and it felt that I said, I'm going to be pleased if you don't that all of these means in the place where I'm going to be so absorbed. So there's already that meaning of it. Um, this is another echelon of society that participates in that I've tried to really think about this me approach of how can I really like be more accessible to what we are now? I, I would love to see you know uh university working more uh in collaboratively collaboratively between its own colleges. When I was in the union and I'm just gonna say when I was there are examples of that like the tech market and challenge of connected university university students with uh companies and uh, startups looking to commercialize technology or um, like a uh, program um, like the Better Ethics and Business Program, actually, which is a course where students actually 
learn about communities and businesses that were at. Now we can do this prestigious awards. We were able to learn from these communities and then investigate them, interview them, and thereafter provide a, um, a recommendation as to who should ultimately be considered. When I was with uh, the farm member within this week, I sometimes found it difficult to um, navigate the different uh, departments. I would have loved to have seen the entities and centers that we were in the um, here that that only served as that economic development, which the best thing I've heard is that economic development is actually not being the professional and expert in specific health care, it's actually being the conduit that provides the connections to the other people that are the experts. Let the people that know and have this knowledge connect with people that are trying to do this work. And so right now in Global Superpower Um with the different networks that each member has, we we love to um, learn about different things that the university is doing. I would love to see the Indian Center be that kind of contact for us, be that kind of contact for anyone else in the community who is trying to solve the problem. So then tap into the university and let me do it. Let's not duplicate that. Let's, let's work for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I believe we've reached our time. And uh, I, I just wanted to thank everybody for. For attending to this, uh, the lieutenant governor had to leave, but thank him very much for his words of wisdom. Thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you. Thank you.